Okay, so um, now we're looking at the rabbinic literature portion of the study. So uh, we look at the Targum Jonathan, and it is an Aramaic and a rabbinic translation of the book of Isaiah and is therefore a very valuable resource for the study of the book of Isaiah. So let's look at the Targum Jonathan here. And so that's what we got right here. Okay, so the Targum Jonathan, it says the following. It says, The terror, the pit, and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the land. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from before the terror, he shall fall into the midst of the pit. He that cometh upon, up out of the midst of the pit shall fall in the snare. For mighty works are done in the heavens, therefore the foundations of the earth quake. The land is shaken, is terribly shaken. The land ter terribly reeleth to and fro. The land is utterly broken. The land is utterly cast down like a drunkard. Um, she is rotting like a couch, and her sins are heavy upon her. She shall fall and rise no more. And it shall come to pass at that time that the Lord shall punish the mighty host that is dwelling in power, and the kings, the sons of men who are dwelling upon the earth. And they shall be utterly gathered for the prison, and they shall be shut up in the dungeon. And after many days they shall be remembered and they shall be confounded that worship the moon, and they shall be ashamed that worship the sun, because the power of the Lord of hosts shall be revealed in Mount Zion and before the elders of his people in glory. Okay, so when we when we read through this, we can see that Jonathan did a pretty good job of rendering pretty much word for word that we see in the Masoretic text. Now, when we compare the Masoretic text with the Targum Jonathan. The Targum Jonathan appears to place a lower emphasis on the spiritual aspect of the host of heaven, right? The, the Targum Jonathan is also referred to as the Targum um, Yonatan, you know, and it's the official Eastern Babylonian Targum, Aramaic translation to the Nevi'im, to the prophets. And the Targum Jonathan is a major source for the history of biblical interpretation. This is why we look at Isaiah after we look at the Hebrew Bible, the Masoretic text. And um, because the reason this is so important for biblical interpretation is it often inserts paraphrasic explanations of which sometimes go back on very old exegetical traditions found in no other rabbinical work. You know, and in which in other cases constitutes the earliest attestation of these these this interpretation. So here, the Targum Jonathan speaks to terror causing one to flee. Right, the terror. Right, that causes causes a person to flee. And the translator of the prophets, um, the Targum Jonathan, chose to focus more on the land of Israel and those who have turned from the paths of righteousness, right? The outcome of those who turn from the Torah of God, the Torah describes the situation, what that sudden fear will overtake such persons and they will ha not have security in the land. They will flee from the enemies, right? And, and this is the description that the Torah gives to those who are unfaithful, right? And we read that in Deuteronomy. You know, and th this is the description according to Isaiah chapter 24, verses 17 and 18. So, um, and it, it says here, it says that um, the terror, the pit, the snare upon the O inhabitant of the land. And it shall come to pass that he who flees before terror, right? He who flees before the terror, he shall fall into the midst of the pit and he shall come up out of the midst of the pit. Um, shall be taken in the snare for mighty works. Mighty works are done in the heavens. Therefore, the foundations of the earth quake. Okay. So, um, and this is exactly how the Torah describes, right? In one who is not, no concern for the holy ways of God. Okay. So, let, let's look at this. And I, I got the English translation because there's so much here we want to look at quickly. Okay. And uh, so, this is from Deuteronomy 28 verses 15 to 26. And it says, But it shall come to pass, if, if thou wilt not hearken or listen unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command you this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, and cursed shalt thou be in the field. Cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. Cursed shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. 
Cursed shall thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee curses, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand up unto for to do, unto thou be destroyed, and unto until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto thee, and unto um, and until he have consumed thee from off the land, whether thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with consumption. And that, when we think about consumption, that's the unknown thing. We don't know what it was that killed him. You know, we call it consumption. So they did in the old days. Okay, so we smite thee with consumption, with a fever and with inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with the blasting and with mildew. And they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass, and the earth that is under thy, under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee, and until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten because of thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed un- into all the kingdoms of the earth. And thy carcasses shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air, and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away okay so the key the key the key verse is is the the hebrew text right here relating to uh what it is the people are doing it says the haya im um tishma beko adonai right it will come to pass if you um, will im lo tishma if you will not listen to the voice of the Lord your God, right? We note how the voice of God comes from the pages of the ancient scriptures. This is an ancient text, okay? It's ancient, right? It is the word of God, the word of the living God. The Torah speaks of the one bringing a curse upon oneself through the rejection of God's holy word, okay? Just the rejection of his word and his ways, right? Just like what we read here in Deuteronomy 28, right? This led then to verse 25 that says, uh, where is that, 25? And it says is it right here, and it says, The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies, and thou shalt go out one way, against them and flee seven ways before them and shall be removed from all the kingdoms of the earth okay and so the the description here is that there is no power right fleeing seven ways right that means that you're trying to get away no matter by any method possible right to to save yourself right and the parallels that we read here in isaiah 24 verses 17 and 18 right and the rabbis always have this messianic expectation of the deliverance of God through the anointed one. And, and we, we can see this in Rashi and in, in his commentary on Isaiah 24, verse 18. Okay, so here uh, Rashi says, He who flees from the sound of, of the fright, okay, from the sound, the noise of, of fear, right, shall fall into the pit, etc. Whoever escapes the sword... Whoever escapes the sword of the Messiah, the son of Joseph, shall fall into the sword of the Messiah, the son of David. And whoever escapes from there shall be snared in the trap of the wars of Gog. Okay, so we got we got Gog here. We got an eschatological thing that Rashi is speaking of. Okay, Rashi's thinking of this eschatological time frame indicated by the wars of Gog. Okay, and so here Rashi, he speaks of the sword of the Messiah, son of Joseph, ben Yosef, right? Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, right? And these are the two messiahs. And he speaks that the, of the sword of, the, of Mashiach ben Yosef, and he speaks of the sword of, of Mashiach Ben David, you know, Judaism teaches that the Messiah of God will be God fearing. He will be a pious Jew. He will be a great Torah scholar and a great leader, right? He will be a direct descendant of David. His coming, however, will be not so to fight a war, we're told according to Zechariah 9, that he will come in meekness 
and gentleness to bring peace. We're told according to Zechariah 9 that the Messiah would come riding humbly upon a donkey, right? As opposed to a conquering king riding a chariot. Zechariah provides us with a picture of the Messiah King who will deliver the people who is a man of peace for all peoples. Okay, the interesting aspect of Rashi's comment is that of the people escaping the sword of Mashiach ben Yosef. Okay, and the interesting thing is that the scriptures themselves are considered the sword, the word of God as a sword of the spirit, right? And the idea of escaping the sword of the peaceful coming of Mashiach is a bit difficult to explain in Rashi's reasoning, but there, there's a way to, we can think about this, you know, concerning the two messiahs, right, interpretation. The scriptures consider the word of God as the word, sword of the spirit. Yeshua came to teach Torah, right? He taught the way of truth, and his teachings change our hearts, right? It brings peace to our soul by the power of God, his spirit dwelling in us. Torah-centric principle, right? And so those who are caught by the sword of Mashiach ben Yosef will have the word internalized into them. They will be transformed by the living God, by the glory of God in their lives, by the spirit of God dwelling in us, right? And those who escape this sword of Mashiach, right, this Messiah, of, of the sword of, of, of Mashiach ben Yosef, those who escape, they will fall by the sword of Mashiach ben David, right? When Yeshua returns, meaning that such a person does not know God. They've rejected Yeshua's words, and so they will fall by the sword, being judged guilty to the very end of the age. And we note this is true according to what Isaiah is saying here in his text. You know, he speaks of fire and how the sword of the Lord will execute judgment upon all men, and many will be of those slain, will be slain by the Lord, right? We, we read Isaiah 66, Isaiah 66, specifically 15 and 16, the verses, but I, I'll read the whole chapter. You know, this will happen when Yeshua, we're told in the New Testament, Yeshua will be revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of Yeshua, of Jesus, right? You know, read that. We read that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. You know, check it out. You know, now, there are many New Testament references on the coming of Mashiach, of the Messiah, on the clouds. We read it in Daniel. We read it in Luke. We, um, we read it in Acts, right? And, the, the, you know, how he ascended. And the scriptures describe how the Messiah was given all authority in Matthew 28. The glory, according to John 17, and the kingdom, according to Luke 22, right? You know, we think about that. He was given all authority. What do you think he can do with that authority, right? He can do anything. He can heal us just like he did when he was here on earth. You know, all we have to do is ask. You know, the New Testament teachings are consistent with Rashi's interpretation when we look at it from this perspective. And it's very interesting, don't you think? You know, and Isaiah, on, here on Isaiah 24, verse 18. Now, the Targum goes on. It says in chapter 24, verse 19 to 21, it says, And the land is terribly shaken. The land trembles, reels to and fro. The land is utterly broken. The land is utterly cast down like a drunkard. He's tottering like a couch, and her sins are heavy upon her. She shall fall and rise no more. And it shall come to pass at that time that the Lord shall punish the mighty host that dwelling in power and the kings of the sons of men who are dwelling upon the earth. Okay, so here in the Targum Jonathan is describing the earth as being shaken and the parallel is to the, the shikor, right? The, uh, the drunkard who cannot walk and who strumble, stumbles uncontrollably. This again is the outcome of those who trust in this world and its riches as opposed to those who trust in the Lord God Almighty. You know, Isaiah, he states, um, what he states in chapter 24, verse 21, can be divided into two verses here, you know, two sections here. And the first, the first clause 
It says it will be at the appointed time that God will inspect the army of power, which is in power. Okay. And then this is the, the first one. And then the second one, uh, it says that, uh, and upon the kings of the sons of men, which are upon the earth. Okay. And we note that we, we look here, our, uh, this is written in Aramaic. Okay. And, Pauli translates this as, uh, in his English translation of the Aramaic, uh, uh, the Targum Jonathan on Isaiah. You can buy that book. I don't know if I got it right offhand here. Um, no, I don't see it. But, um, yeah, okay, anyway, <laughs> it's back here somewhere. But um, he translates this as, and it shall come to pass at that time that the Lord shall punish the mighty host that dwelling that is dwelling in power and the kings, the sons of men who are dwelling upon the earth. Okay, so the concepts of the army of power and the mighty host are consistent with each other. You know, the commentary or um, Torah or uh, 45 has a following interpretation concerning these things. And so um, let me... Okay, so th this is a big one. Uh, wait a minute. Let me look at the title again. Maybe it had a typo there. Okay, it's not Torah or it doesn't look like. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, it is right. It is right here. <laughs> I shortened it. Right there, I shortened it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that is uh. Uh, Shnei Luchot Habrit Torah Shebi Chatav Chukat Torah Or. Okay, so it, it might be on Parashat Chukat. This is written on. So, okay, so it says, When Israel was freed from the dominance of the angel of death, while it received the Torah at Mount Sinai and lost its freedom due to the sin of the golden calf, the angel Mada. Tarmolin was the face of an ox looked up position on Israel's left and Satan and the nations of the world started counting the people. Once the sin had been re redressed by means of, amongst other things, the ashes of the red heifer, okay, um, Torah, the angel um, that normally the, uh, so that even the uh, Torah Yadid um, Tamima was restored to being perfect. Negates portends evil had to approve Israel's rehabilitation. When this condition does not exist, our situation re is reversed and all our adversaries are waiting in the wings to applaud our downfall. In the introduction to Midrash Rabbah of Eicha, we find the comment on Daniel 8.12. It says, um, Mali, Mali Chiyut, um for example, Seva and a set time army will be allotted to daily sacrifice because of sin. In that day, um, then we we see this. They're talking about the Seva Ham Hamarom Bamarom, right? The this host in heaven is the dominance of by other nations. We know this from Isaiah twenty four twenty one. We refer to um, Tamid. The Lord will punish the hosts of heaven in heaven and the kings of the earth on earth and the occupy themselves with it by day and uh, by night, right? By day and by night in Daniel is a reference to Israel since it is written, refers to the sin of neglecting Torah, okay? And let's underline that. And any, um, okay, in the word uh, tamid by night uh the time Israel throws Torah to the ground, okay, and other nations will prevail over us since it says that truth is a reference to Torah, emet, you know, when it throws truth to the ground, we know that by the by the truth, never sell it. If you throw words of Torah to the ground, other nations will act and will immediately prevail against you. Confirmation of this is found in Daniel 12, or 8 verse 12, and succeed. Since Gentiles do not have Torah, the verses the verse must refer to the Gentiles prevailing over Israel. Okay, so um, there was a lot in there, but we note something about this rabbinic commentary, how the rabbis state that when the people of Israel received the Torah at Sinai, they were freed from the dominance of the angel of death. Okay, 
interesting interesting interpretation right torah right and being free and however when the people sinned with the golden calf they lost their freedom and so this reveals to us how the torah is in and of itself powerless to save a person from sin you know and this is why paul wrote what he did in romans that the torah makes one aware of sin in guilt but does not save okay and and this does not mean that the torah is not the way of life but illustrates the weakness of man to overcome sin without the help of god and his indwelling spirit by faith in the messiah yeshua right in addition there was something external that was needed to restore the people and that that was where they they speak of the the ashes of the red heifer and of this this cleansing right and the rabbis say that the, the ashes of the red heifer pur purify and make one clean now that, that that's what the torah says okay that's what it says in, in the scriptures and the parallels that we're reading here is to what yeshua said in john 15 verse 3 where it says you have already been pur pruned and purified by the message i have given you and um the english standard version already you are clean because of the word i've spoken to you and then in first john chapter 1 verse 7 it says but if you walk in the light as i as he is in the light he, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of jesus the son purifies us from all sin okay so this this uh is an external act of god which cleanses and purifies us we note that you know okay so th this is how the ashes of the red heifer are understood the ashes render the one who collects the ashes unclean right they burn the heifer and but then when they mix them with water they become waters of purification many making one clean and this is taken by faith in god and his holy word and this is an act of god and this parallels what yeshua did such that by faith we believe and are purified we're made clean being made pure and having the presence of god dwelling within by faith of Yesh in yeshua the word of god becomes the way of life and the rabbis say that it is written to occupy yourself with it by day and by night right tamid constantly always okay and the commentary also states that any any time israel throws torah to the ground other nations will prevail and this is relevant for our lives today as god's word is to be studied memorized and applied to our lives now um the targum jonathan goes on there's a big white space in my uh in the study i'm gonna check that out but the targum jonathan goes on in verse 22 and 23 and it says and they shall be utterly gathered from the prison and they shall be shut up in a dungeon and after many days they shall be remembered and they shall be confounded that worship the moon and they shall be ashamed that worship the sun because the power of the lord of hosts shall be revealed in mount zion and before the elders of his people in glory okay so the ancient canaanite religion dealt with the sun and the moon okay and the, the ugaritic tablets are particularly useful for understanding the nature of the religion in the bronze age canaan okay and egyptian mesopotamian Hurrian, and hittite ideas would have influenced as well as being affected by these ugaritic traditions you know furthermore all the existing texts are connected with royal or official religious institutions not the religion of the general population so people throughout canaan worshipped many deities as indicated by the theophoric names uh toponyms and biblical texts and inscriptions over 150 canaanite gods can be found in the ugaritic texts it's amazing yes that's why i said that there's a parthenon of gods in this canaanite religions right and the structure of the canaanite parthenon can be compared to a divine family or governmental hierarchy and the concept of the assembly of gods seen throughout the ancient near east can be clearly seen in the ugaritic myths and so i got that out of the uh, lexem bible dictionary on canaanite religion that's where i got that that information from so there is a common semitic term for god that is l which is described as the high god and the head of the divine assembly and the text states that baal rebelled against l and took over as chief god and there were, there were three main sections of the ugaritic myths concerning baal baal right is is one is describes the the building of his temple or palace on mount zaphon Two describes his conflict with the god of the underworld, Mote, 
by whom he is killed and must raise again to ensure the renewal of the world's fertility. I mean, note, there's a resurrection theme, okay? And then Baal was known as the mightiest of heroes and the victorious Baal. And then three, um, the third thing describes his fight for kingship with Yom, the god of the sea and rivers, who, who reflects the chaotic aspect of water. Yom often occurs with and is probably identified with various sea serpents. And so this myth celebrates Baal's kingship and might against the powers of chaos and destruction. And may also show his protection of sailors and votive anchors that were found in his temple in Ugarit. Okay, and um, so here the Targum Jonathan describes how those who worship the moon and the sun you know, they'll be confounded and ashamed, right? And uh, the reason being is that the Lord God will Almighty will cast these false gods down upon whom the people trust. And it is in these things that we find the context of the sun and the moon being ashamed in, in Isaiah 24, verses 19 to 21. Now, Midrash 10, Huma and Ibn Ezra have the following to say concerning these verses. So um, we just got one more slide after this. So... Um, in Midrash Tanhuma, Bo 4, part 7, it says, Rabbi Mir said, and the wild ox descended with them, implies that their idols were cast down with them in Egypt. He expected retribution from their idols. He also punished them in Edom. He destroyed their guardian angel, right? There we go. We see that again, right? The guardian angel. And after that, he destroyed them, as it is said, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish the hosts of the high heaven on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Okay. And then Midrash 10, Huma um, 10, uh, let's see, 18, uh, on Mishpatim 18.10, it says, and so he would do in the future, he would punish their, he would punish their guardian angels and even the, and, and when the kings of the nations and as it is said, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish the hosts of the high heaven on high. There's our verse, right? And the kings of the earth upon the earth. The Holy One, blessed be he, said to Israel, In this world I will send an angel to make the peoples of the world flee from you. But in the future I will lead you and I will send Elijah before you. As it is said, before behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And then um, Malachi 3.24. And then um, the Ibn Ezra text, okay? And this is what I'm concluding with here in the study. It says, many refer to this predi prediction to an eclipse of the sun and the moon, but more correctly is referred to the angels that are ready to assist or to attack a nation. Um, Daniel 10, 13 and verse 20, these words are therefore followed by the kings of the earth on the earth, for the reign of the kings is a con connection with the reign of the angels. Those unknown causes that govern the destinies of men and nations are sometimes personified and re represented as the messengers of the angels of the Lord. Each nation is therefore said to have its own angel above. Right there. You remember, I was, I was talking about that. Each angel has its own angel above in whose hand is destiny, its destiny is placed and the prosperity of the or the misfortune of a nation is made dependent on the success of or failure of its representative angel above, okay? And so you, we see this, this underlying spiritual force, right? Doesn't it sound like a, a lot like Ephesians chapter 6? You know, Paul talked about that. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, right? We wrestle against the spiritual forces. And this is this these are the things that we see here um, in Midrash Tent Huma, and Ibn Ezra are talking about, okay? And we note how the Midrash interprets Isaiah 24, verse 21, as, as we did, stating that these idols were cast down, their guardian angel is destroyed, and the Lord punishes the host of, of, the, heaven, of the high heaven on high, you know, as a reference to, those, to these things, right? Midrash Tanhuma states that the destruction of the spiritual forces are over the nations is connected to the Lord God Almighty sending an angel to cause the people of the world to flee from Israel. And the Lord God will lead Israel sending Elijah before them, quoting from Malachi 3.23. And this is a pronouncement of the forerunner to the Messiah, John the Baptist, right? And the purpose is given according to Malachi 4.6. And it says, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse, right? You got this 
honor your father, right, and your mother, right? A very important command, right? And we note the connection here to the text from Isaiah through the curse on the earth, which would lead to its destruction. You know, what we're reading in all of Isaiah 24, we note that the Nevi'im, the prophet section of the Tanakh, ends with the judgment of a curse known as harem, okay? And, and this is a reference to the devoted thing, an object or person that is devoted to the God of Israel, whether for cultic use or for destruction. And this is the worst type of curse, one of utter destruction. And this, this is the rabbis in their reading of the book of Malachi in the synagogue do not like to include the reading from the curse. And after reading verse 6, they repeat verse 5, so that it will not close on a curse. And we also note that 400 years later, the blessing of the coming of Messiah of God had come to restore the relationship of the world with the Creator God for those who would believe in Him. And we note how Ibn Ezra does not interpret these things as spiritual forces who are deceiving the nations. I mean, he considers these as allusions to the personification of unknown causes which should govern which govern the destinies of men and nations, right? He He's more of a realist, you know, he's, he does not a spiritualist, right? And he utilizes this concept to describe the angel above who is judged based on the angel's success or failure. And we note again how these things draw out what the Torah speaks of, um, those who bring a curse upon oneself through the rejection of God's holy word, right? We read in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And this leads to the verse in, in Deuteronomy 28, verse 5, it says, The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies, and thou shalt go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. And, and this is the outcome of those who reject the instruction of God, the word of the living God, who reject the Bible, right? And according to the Talmud, Pesachin uh, 28a, the Gemara states that the, the verse referring to the sun and the moon being ashamed before the glow of the divine presence it is referring to the world to come, which is an entirely different world, where it says that their light will increase, is referring to the days of Mashiach, right, to the Messiah. You know, ultimately, the application of these things for our lives today, from Isaiah 24, is to the importance of God's word in preparing for that day, right? You know, these things reveal to us how there are spiritual forces working in the background to deceive. And this is the spiritual war that Paul calls the day of evil in Ephesians 6.13. You know, Paul tells us in his passage to be strong in the Lord and to stand firm. You know, how does one stand firm if he or she does not do so by faith in God's holy word, right? In addition to this, Peter tells us to resist the devil, stand firm in the face and in, in, in the faith, right, in 1 Peter 5 9. You know, Peter is teaching us that faith in God is the key to standing firm in the midst of the day of evil. You know, John tells us also not to be afraid when we are in tribulation because Yeshua has already overcome the world in John 16, verse 33. You know, all of these things, all of these things that we've been studying, you know, that they support the New Testament text concerning the days of Mashiach or the days of Messiah. Faith in God, our Father in heaven, and in this Torah-centric principle of God dwelling on our, in our midst through the indwelling of the power of God by His Holy Spirit, through by our faith in Yeshua the Messiah. You know, that this is... This is what I feel all of these things, they culminate in, right? And so um, that's what I had for the study for tonight. Hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I enjoy, always enjoy teaching. And, and come back next week. We're going to start Isaiah 25, okay? Thanks for listening. Bye.